welcome back. We've looked at the crazy motions of the Sun and planets that are required for geocentrism to tie with observations. In this part we'll look at how something as simple as a meteor shower stuffs up geocentrism, and see just how sci-fi it has to go to keep up its illusion. Comets present a few hurdles. Those with elliptical orbits go around the Sun, which provides a rather obvious clue as to where the largest mass in the solar system is. Good luck to any geocentrist who wants to describe the motion of a comet orbiting the Sun circling the Earth. But that's just the first obvious problem they face. As we know, as comets draw closer to the Sun, they eject gases, water and dust. This forms the comet's coma and its hydrogen envelope. The solar wind carries gases away, forming the ion tail. Radiation pressure carries sufficiently small dust particles to form the curved dust tail. Larger particles stay on or near the comet's orbital path and spread out along it over time. Numerous meteor showers occur throughout the year and are caused when Earth passes through the debris trails that comets leave behind. These showers are predictable and each occurs in the same date range each year. Not all debris trails cross our path, of course, but that most famous comet, Halley, gives us two showers each year. The Eta Aquariids in early May, and the Orionids in late October. With geocentrism, Earth is static. Comets orbiting the Sun, as they do, will never have orbital paths that cross ours, because geocentrism doesn't give Earth the luxury of a path. Similarly then, any debris that remains along the comet's path also won't meet our atmosphere. Geocentrists are left with two mechanisms by which cometary dust can enter Earth's atmosphere. Any comets that pass between Earth and the Sun could have the lightest dust particles pushed our way by radiation pressure. This wouldn't work because the particles would drift into the daylight side of Earth, so we wouldn't see them anyway. The other alternative would be gravity. This would involve some severe cherry-picking on the part of geocentrists. Having the gravity of Earth acting on distant motes of dust acknowledges that small masses have higher acceleration towards larger masses than the reverse. This leads to the interesting question of why they think this goes around this, when everywhere else in the universe the barycenter of two orbiting masses is always closer to the larger mass. And how would a comet like Halley, with a 76-year orbital period, produce two meteor showers per year in the geocentric universe anyway? In short, it wouldn't, because geocentrism is bollocks. For a non-rotating fixed Earth, anything entering the atmosphere must have explicitly headed towards the planet. This must occur in waves to produce annual meteor showers, and all the dozens of meteor showers do this whilst spinning like a top around Earth every day with the background stars, and whilst geostationary satellites sit virtually motionless, somehow. How do geocentrists explain this? How are these showers caused such that the same shower radiates from the same area of sky every time? It's simple, surely. Someone, presumably some kind of sky fairy, must be moving around the Earth throughout the year sprinkling dust into the atmosphere as he goes, Meteor showers are purely for our entertainment, to make the world a prettier place to live, and to show us how fantastic the Sky Fairy's powers are. Alternatively, an orbiting Earth crosses the dust trails of various comets each year, and this is bollocks. The Sky Fairies, however, usually have a connection with light. 
Unfortunately, the light that such fairies usually regard as good and perfect presents yet another problem for geocentrists. It places a rather obvious limit on the size of the universe. If the entire universe is rotating round Earth every day, and knowing that nothing can travel faster than light, the maximum circumference of their fantasy universe is obviously one light day. We can use this to find the maximum possible radius of the universe. Light travels at nearly 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. A sidereal day is 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4.1 seconds, or 86,164.1 seconds. Multiply the two and we find that a light day is 25,849,230,000 kilometers. We know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, and we can rearrange to find r to get the maximum radius for the geocentric universe of 4,114,032,729.619 km. Earth at perihelion is a little under 150 million kilometers from the Sun. If we consider the range of distances that Neptune can be observed to be from the Sun, we find that it is outside the maximum bounds of the geocentric universe. Neptune, then, must be circling the Earth faster than the speed of light. A remarkable achievement. And, of course, the further away from Earth you go, the higher the multiple of the speed of light that something has to be moving to circle the Earth once a day. Our nearest star, Proxima Centauri, at just 4.24 light-years distant, would have to be circling the Earth at 9,750 times the speed of light. The centre of the galaxy, around 26,000 light-years away, would have to be circling the Earth at around 60 million times the speed of light. The Andromeda Galaxy? 5.8 billion times the speed of light. How do intellectually lazy geocentrists account for any of this when they don't even have basic maths on their side? They can't, because their faster-than-light spinning universe is bollocks. As if light speed didn't knacker the geocentrists' hopeless views enough, there is another problem with having everything circling the Earth every day. Take Neptune, which we now know must be circling the Earth faster than the speed of light. Aside from the impossibility of that, basic mechanics tells us that an object will remain at constant velocity unless some force acts on it. To circle the Earth, some constant force is needed so that Neptune doesn't just fly off into space in a straight line a centripetal force. The minimum distance from Earth for Neptune is 4.3 quadrillion metres. The angular velocity, omega, of an object moving in a circle is 2 pi radians over t, where t is the orbital period, one sidereal day for anything orbiting the geocentric Earth. The centripetal force, acting on a body of mass m, moving along a curved path of radius r, is mr omega squared. We know omega, so this gives us a centripetal force of mr 4 pi squared over t squared. Plug in the mass of Neptune, its minimum distance from Earth, and the length of a sidereal day in seconds, and the force needed to hold Neptune circling the Earth once a day is at least 2 nonillion, 345 octillion, 267 septillion, 264 sextillion, 452 quintillion, 592 quadrillion, 208 trillion, 897 billion, 780 million, 154,692.4 newtons. Which is a large number. It's a force large enough to accelerate the Earth at over 392 kilometers per second per second. What could naturally be supplying a force that would keep Neptune circling the Earth? No, it's not Mr. Space Hammer Man. There is only one contender. Gravity, you f***ing retard! Even the most retarded geocentrist can't claim gravity is a lie. But wait, let's consult Golden Crocoduck nominee, Fernie Boy 100. Of course, Fernie Boy has a different view of gravity. In the comments to part two of this series, he claims that gravity does not hold the air or atmosphere or any gas whatsoever to the Earth. If it did, then clouds would also stay above fixed points on Earth. But we can still clearly see that the clouds do anything but stay above fixed points. <laughs> uh, um, ever heard of wind? 
gravity acting on Earth is coming in from all sides. It's energy generated by a combination of Earth's magnetic heavy metal content and the rotating universe moving around it. So the Earth is held stable and in place for this force you call gravity. You think it comes from inside Earth, but it comes from out there. It goes the same direction as traditional gravity, but once again this is an inverted truth. Any inverted truth has a better chance of deceiving people. That's right, gravity is part of a 300 year long anti-theistic conspiracy to deceive the world about the true forces of nature. Unfortunately, Fernie Boy refuses to provide any proof, so as yet his Nobel Prize remains unclaimed. So we'll have to go with Newtonian gravity for now because, hey, it works for everything else and it appears to be doing a nice job of holding the Galilean satellites and the 63 other moons around Jupiter and all of the other hundreds of moons around their host object. What mass does Earth need to have to supply the necessary 2.3 nonillion newtons to Neptune via gravitation? The gravitational force is the universal gravitational constant times the mass of Neptune times the mass of Earth over the radius between them squared. Rearrange this and we can find the mass of the Earth needed to sustain the geocentric view of Neptune. This comes out at 6.36 times 10 to the 39 kilograms which sounds a bit high. It is. It's over one quadrillion times the actual mass of Earth. It's also over three billion times the mass of the Sun, which means that for Neptune to circle the Earth each day, Earth has to be one of the largest black holes in the universe. 776 times the mass of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. At this point, detractors may complain about the use of the mass of Neptune. We don't need it anyway. Gravity is providing our centripetal force, so they are equal. The mass of Neptune cancels out on both sides, so the necessary mass for Earth is a function of the distance to Neptune and the period of one sidereal day. Plug in the numbers and bang! The same answer as before. What you should have taken from this is that the mass of the circling body is actually irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it's a golf ball. It doesn't matter if we swap Neptune for Jupiter. It doesn't matter if Neptune is made of cheese. For any object to circle Earth in one sidereal day due to gravity, the necessary mass of Earth is a function only of the distance to the object and the period of circulation. Pi, G and T are constants, so for the geocentric universe, the mass of Earth needed is 79.68 times the distance to the object cubed. The problem with this is that an object circling Earth once a day here requires one mass, 79.68 r cubed. Move twice as far out and the mass needed for an object there to circle the Earth once a day is 79.68 r cubed, which is eight times greater. Move twice as far out again and Earth needs to have eight times as much mass again. Move twice as far out again and Earth needs to have 512 times more mass than we started with. Every object circling Earth each day therefore needs a different mass to provide the necessary centripetal force to keep it doing that. Earth must therefore be any number of necessary masses all at the same time, which of course is plausible. No, 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 really. How then is the geocentrist universe possible? F***ing magic, of course! It's just another reason why its proponents have contributed nothing to human knowledge or progress using their model. And it's why, once again, it doesn't take much thought to conclude that geocentrism is bollocks. In part four of this series, we'll take a look at how much geocentrism can contribute to the space age. This should be fun. See you then.